Lakes Community uh, Meeting. Um, our guest speaker is Ernesto Lasso de la Vega and his uh, intern Elizabeth Niles. Ernesto is uh, with the Lee County High School Control District. He's going to answer and give us information about what's going on with our lakes. Welcome, Ernesto. Thank you. Thank you. you know, this is scary when you have a microphone. <laughs> but one, I want to thank you all, but especially those girls who are selling the lemonade in the corner down there. Because I got the lemonade from them, yeah. It's a funny story. I actually, looking in my wallet, I only had 20s and 10s. Oh, boy. I'll add the 10, you know, that will be fine. But it's the, the what do you call it, inflation? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so I two, they need two lemonades and, and the candy. So I am so happy to be here because you guys are really rock because you're doing samples and then you're here because you're interested on this information. Bless you guys. And then, um, but along with me, I brought the intern, Elizabeth Niles. She's a student from the FGCU and also a biology student, and also an intern in our department, in a lab. So she's taking samples, she's running the lab, so the data that is wrong is hers. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I, won't, I won't do that. Um, okay, so let me advance, because I want to make it short so we have room for questions, because I know there might be a lot of questions. Um, so first, just so those, those who don't know, Palm Watch is a monitoring program. It started 30 years ago in 2000, no, 1992. So it has been 30 years of sampling. We learn a lot, and we're always advising homeowners to bring a sample to us so we can run the analysis and find out the objectively what's happening in the pond. That's the, the, the bottom line of our program. Okay, so you guys sample all the ponds in February. It was a massive, these are all the ponds that you have, and this is not so strong. But anyway, you see, the pond ID, uh, the, from 1 to 27, but 27 is not a pond. 27 is the reclaimed water, straight from the pipe. So that's the reason why you see, okay, so the, the, night, the colors in red or on, um, pink, can we turn the lights on a little bit so we can see them? Or the lights are impossible to, I don't mind if we turn this side off. <laughs> because the colors are a lot better when you see it. No, it's okay. So the colors pink indicates that are out of range. Okay, let me start with indicating. Ah, oh, perfect. The top is the each parameter that we take analysis. Um, the phosphorus, total phosphorus to orthophosphorus. The differences between those two is that total is everything. Ortho is the free available phosphorus swimming in the water. When I say total phosphorus, I'm talking bacteria, algae, particles of things. So ortho, the OP, that's only the free swimming. Now you have both of them, as you see. And when I say pink, it's because they exceed the maximum that is, I notice in ponds, when you go above that, I will flag and says, you have more than most stormwater ponds in Southwest Florida. Point one is what I consider the limit, and we'll talk about that a little later. The other parameters, nitrates, NOx, ammonia, and then total nitrogen. So nitrogen is another element that we do analysis, but I separate them by nitrates and ammonia because ammonia will tell me if you have a fish kill. The nitrates will tell me if you have fertilizers. So those are the reasons why I do that separation. And the total nitrogen is the, the sum of both these two and then total nitrogen. Chlorophyll is the pigment in the algae. If you extract the algae in the filter and you extract it with acetone, and you can tell how much algae is in 100 milliliters that we sample. So this number will tell me how much algae is there. The ones in pink are extremely high. I mean, God, that line is in 40. If you go above 40, you get a pink little square there. So chlorophyll, and the last one is the salinity. Salinity, why? Because we have a huge hurricane, if you remember something, I have a hurricane actually. <laughs> so a big storm, Zorge came over and flooded a lot of places. Well, you were not affected. All these salinities are less than one, meaning that it's fresh water. So the ponds are fresh water at this point. And this is in February. 
Okay, and here are all your pumps and you know them by numbers and I'm the same over here. Now, I put something in graphics because you can probably see better in the graphics like who is above, who's... So the pumps are 9 all the way to 26. Again, this big building here that you see at the very end, that's the reclaimed water that is above and way past. So I kept it and put the number over there, 2.0. That's extremely high phosphorus in the reclaimed water. Now, everybody else, the line that you see horizontal here, that's my limit, 0.1. Everything that above, above 2.1 means that is about my maximum average concentration for phosphorus in a stormwater pond. So these guys are way out there. And that's, that's what is showing this graphic. The next one, nitrogen. So I use purple. And the same thing, the line is the maximum. In this case, is 2 milligrams per liter. That's the maximum. You have not reached any of your ponds do not have extremely high nitrogen, which is good. But we'll get to that later. This guy here, again, 7. I have to cut the line and put the number there so you have an idea. But there's a lot of nitrogen in the water there. Okay, the last one, oh, not the last one, the next slide. Gross LA is the pigment in the algae. So the more, the higher the bar, the more algae you have. These three ponds, 1, 14, and 25, I don't know who lives there. <laughs> don't say your number. <laughs> so that number is higher because the 40 is what I consider high for protofill, high for algae, is to the point that if you put your hand in there, you start losing sight of your fingers because it's so turbid. And turbidity is caused by the algae that grows there. And the algae grows because you have phosphorus and nitrogen nutrients. All right, so now we're going to complicate the life. Boom! All three together. <laughs> so the bars are the same. The lines are the same. They're described. But the reason I'm presenting this is just to show you something else. So algae grows because you have nitrogen and phosphorus. But it's not always simple like that. Nature is more complicated. It depends on the ratio. You have higher nitrogen than phosphorus. And I see that in many cases. Nitrogen is high, phosphorus is low. Nitrogen is really high, phosphorus is low, and then you have algae. And then again here, high nitrogen, low phosphorus. The ratio between those two is 10 to 1. In fact, the next slide probably will explain it better. And let me go into a little bit of biology here. So when you have, okay, nitrogen and phosphorus stimulate algae. But when you have the ratio 10 to 1, that's the ratio that the algae grow the best. Now, sometimes the both concentration will be low and there will be no algae because it's very low concentration. But sometimes it's very high, will be a lot of algae. So 10 to 1 is the ideal ratio. And I'm talking about dividing nitrogen divided by phosphorus, 10 to 1. Now, if I change that ratio, so you have 5 to 1, 5 nitrogen and 1 phosphorus, that means you are so low in nitrogen that the algae will not grow because it is limiting the amount of nitrogen. Therefore, if you see the faint green there, is because the algae is not growing. So you have low nitrogen, some amount of phosphorus, but there's nitrogen not enough to stimulate the algae. Yeah, it's all weak, 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 weak. The opposite is also true. You have high nitrogen here, 20, instead of 10, 20, double that. And then the same amount of phosphorus, one. So the nitrogen, I mean, in this case, is so high, what is limiting is the phosphorus the algae will not grow because it's limited in phosphorus. So, you see, 10 to 1 is ideal. If you go above that, I'm talking 20, 17, higher than 17, it's what they call it high phosphorus, no, high nitrogen, low phosphorus, limiting in phosphorus. This one is limited in nitrogen, this one is limited in phosphorus. Okay, now, so we have that concept. Are we clear with that? Yeah. 10 to 1 is Good. About 10 to 1, you have too much nitrogen, very little phosphorus. This one, too little phosphorus. Okay, so let me move to complicate your life for real and ask. Whoa. So don't panic, don't panic. We're going to digest this. 
So I put the total nitrogen of everybody and the total phosphorus in the next column, which the phosphorus is very high to begin with. And I did the, um, what do you call this? the division. So the ratio nitrogen-phosphorus is right here. Some of them are low, some of them are high, but the ones who are 10, they are ideal. However, if you look at this guy here, 96 point, that's a lot of algae. So how come is the ratio 14, what happened? You should be having, you know, not too much algae, you don't have that ratio. So what I suspect that is happening there is that when you have too much algae, the algae will remove the nutrients from the water, so I cannot find the nitrogen in the water or the phosphorus because the algae is holding it all up. So it's chicken and an egg. The algae is there because the nutrients stimulate the algae, but the algae is also taking all the nutrients and it's showing me in my water there's no nutrients because the big algae is taking it all up. So that's the story here. And that, um, that concept, limiting factor, means that these ponds, uh, the ones who are in purple, means that they are limiting by nitrogen. In other words, they don't have enough nitrogen to stimulate the algae, to create a, an algae bloom. So they are not showing in the column any algae problem because they're limited in nitrogen. The ones in red is the opposite. They are limited by phosphorus, so the algae is not bloom because phosphorus is low. So what this all about limiting factors had to do with us? Well, you have reclaimed water. Look at this baby down here. It's huge. Phosphorus galore. Nitrogen, boom, galore. So in the reclaimed water, if they are limited by nitrogen or phosphorus, the reclaimed water has so much that if you pour some of that reclaimed water, you will have an algae room because you're giving them whatever is necessary for them to grow. Boom! And then you have it under. So what happened? Well, you give them what is limiting by giving them the food with the reclaimed water. And I'd say that because we have been measuring that reclaimed water for years. And then always high, high, high. Now, you know where the reclaimed water comes from, right? The wastewater treatment plant. They process that. They chlorinate it so it doesn't have any bacteria, viruses, parasites. And they sell it to you, but with all the nitrogen, all the phosphorus that comes out of the rippling one. They don't sequester any of that. Now, is that possible now? Yeah, no. There are advanced water treatment plants, which they are not. They are advanced that they actually remove all that stuff. And when they remove that, they can put that in public waters like the river, the sterile, the whatever. But because they don't have that advance, they're selling it to you with all the nasty stuff and saying, oh, well, you can fertilize without the need for fertilization. Yeah, that's all part of the selling game. Uh, but then it's overdone. You're giving you a lot of, more than what you need. Anyway, we'll get to that later. Um, uh, the, so the last three years I put this, because we have all the ponds, and I've been, I highlighted here these four guys, because your input on those ponds, nitrogen, phosphorus, algae, is affecting not just your community, but this is the canal, Macduno, Macdono, what's the name of it? Macd, I call it because I cannot pronounce it, Macdono. That canal is outside of your community, and all these red lines are culverts that are connecting. Your pond overflows to this canal, and we have been collecting water, we have been treating those ponds year and year, and now we're just going into the rainy season, we're going to have more to do in that canal. I'm telling you from the Heisen Control District, which controls the vegetation on the canals, we're going to have a lot of problems there because the source is your community. And I'm sorry to step on you guys. <laughs> but hey, the truth is coming out of here. And you can see the numbers of chlorophyll high in those particular ones. The peak also means here high, high, high. Look at this guy, 82. And yes, it is getting high. So that's just to, to let you know that your actions have an effect of outside of the community. It's not like all the states only here now, and there's more. A um, couple more things. Oh, this is a, a warning. This is not in your community. This is another one, but I brought it in because Microcystis aeruginosa, the blue-green algae that is um, like the guacamole when it's highly concentrated. This is right here in Fort Myers. 
That algae is uh, one that produces toxicity in the air. And one warning I'm going to give you is if you smell in the air like dirt, like if you took your hands and you rub it on dirt and you smell that dirt, that is the aromatic uh, senses that microcystis displays into the atmosphere. And along with that aroma, there goes toxins. And I don't want to sound like, hey, the, the, fall is, the sky is falling. But there is toxicity associated with this algae and so on. So the university is looking into that, how to control this algae, because it has health issues related to this. And I just want to present that because that canal is loaded with that. Not right now, but it will be in a few more months. And we'll see that. And in the river, well, you can probably see that in the news already, Okeechobee and the river bringing all that stuff over here. So again, I don't want to sound like, hey, like the sky is falling, but be aware of that. Okay, the next one, finally, that's two slides I have. In conclusion, I'm going to read it slowly. The majority of the pond in Sandoval have plenty dissolved phosphorus in the water. That's a lot of, more than you need. So phosphorus is big, big one. The source of phosphorus could be internal cycling from the muck accumulation. So you have years and years of treatment and years and years of algae being deposited. So you're making a cake of muck in the bottom. I mean, it, I don't know, I haven't been there, but if you put a pipe and you pull it out, you will see how many inches or maybe foot of, of, of muck. And that might be part of the source of the phosphorus. Um, the yard waste, uh, that ran into the ponds via street drainage, uh, all the clipping uh, can go right into there, and that's more phosphorus that's also providing, those clippings are providing. And I saw some culverts, you know, they, when they cut the grass and they run into the culvert, yeah, all that is phosphorus that they're eventually going to make more phosphorus. Um, excessive use of reclaimed water, and I already talked about that, you know, you, and, and I'm coming back again to that one. Nitrogen. Limited nutrient is the limiting nutrient, so you don't have nitrogen in most of those ponds, but that can be supplied by the reclaimed water. So you don't have it, but it can be provided by your reclaimed water because you're just planting there. And the last thing you guys have aeration, but it has to be bubbles, bubblers, bubblers, not the fountains. Fountains are not aerating, they're just splashing, they look nice. And in the summer, no, in the winter, they dry your pond because they have evaporation. But highly recommend bubblers. Why? Because they do mix the water, they mix it, and they, they actually help on the oxidation of the muck that you might have in the bottom. You might notice, maybe if you go diving, around where the air stone is, you might find very little muck because the aerobic bacteria will break that muck where the source is of oxygen is there. And usually around the air stones are where I find that. Um, 24 hours, yeah, all year round. Don't, if you have broken some, fix them because they do maintain. And that's one of the ironies in Florida, like, oh, everything has to be natural. No, we have to, because these are artificial systems. So you have to put energy to fix that or to maintain it at least. Oh, and then the bubblers do extend the life of the ponds. I've seen that, and golf courses know that. Putting aerators, bubblers, you will extend the life of the pond. Okay, now, in recommendations, and this, this is truly the last part, the last slide. Continue monitoring the worst ponds to find the main source of the problem. And when I'm saying the main source, could be irrigation with water, uh, reclaimed water, fertilization maybe, feeding the ducks, I don't know if you do that, but some people do that, and it's not good. Um, dog waste, uh, people who have big dogs, and they go twice a day, and they don't pick it up. No, no, it's my backyard, I don't want that yard, I do not have, I don't want to pick that up. Well, it will run into it, yeah. So those are the, the things that, that keep an eye on that. Keep, oh, keep an eye on the harmful algae bloom, especially the blue green that I pointed out, <coughs> microcystis, serruginosa, or any other. There's anabina, there's acetanoxins, there's a bunch of them that produce uh, toxins. Consider limit the irrigation with the rippling water, especially if rain is anticipated. When you saturate, with the rain saturates the soil, and then you put the 
the irrigation, all that's going to be, the water, the soil already have water. So the reclaim is going to go above the right into your pond. You see the physics of that? You saturate the water in that soil and because the rain was the day before. And no, 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 I can irrigate. I irrigate. And the water, the green king is going to right into the pond, right above the other one. Um, yes. Consider sequestration of phosphorus and algae with flocculants. And the reason I say that is because other pond watchers, other people in the other communities, they have that algae problem. Big time. Oh my God, they want a picture I show you? Yes. I'm going to reveal where that is. But what they did is that hire a company who do use alum, and the alum is a flocculent that you put, in fact, they use it in the wastewater treatment plants to grab and sink everything from colored tannins to bacteria, algae, everything goes sink in the wastewater, same in the ponds. And this is not poison. It's not a chemical that is considered poison they use in the water treatment plant, so aloe. But there's a new product, and I'm not trying to sell that product, but I saw it, and it's pretty, pretty good. Ultrasorb is actually another, another flocculant, but it uses less alum, less than alum, and is uh, quite efficient of grabbing the phosphorus and absorb, uh, linking, what do you call that? Fixing the phosphorus to that molecule of ultrasorb. And it is ready available. People can buy them on, online. The last thing, watch out for landscaping debris and fertilizer activities because, as you know, the fertilizer ban is from June to September 30. Well, and I done this also testing that outside of that ban, the fertilizer companies come and yeah, 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 yeah. Before June, they will fertilize the heck. Oh, because the plants have to eat. So they fertilize the heck out of it. And that's not so bad on the, in June, before June. The bad one is in October. Because then you come, uh, October is still rain. So, it, oh, no, no, but you need to put all the fertilizer that you didn't put up throughout the whole year. You have to put it in one sitting, boom. And it comes up big rain and washes it into it. Like, oh, my God, you just fertilize our pond for, for a whole year. In one day, boom, in the rain. So keep an eye on that. Talk to the fertilizer company. Tell them, listen. Slow release, certain amount, and outside of the pen. And then when you have rain, do not fertilize it before. Now, how to predict that rain? Watch the weather, man. <laughs> Something in that line. Yes, sir. Uh, how many people smell the uh, fertilizer smell? Let's say on May thirty first. Yeah. Yeah. So probably smell that. Well, that was fertilizer. That's and fertilizer. Yes. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. They say they combined the two of them together. Oh, okay. Well, it smelled like pig. It was fertilizer, though. Yeah. You're right. It smelled like pig. Oh, that's right. And that's the day before the deadline. And we already started getting some rains. Excuse me. I just want to bring that up. Also, I think you may confuse people when you said 10 to 1. Oh, that's really good. Good for algae. Bad for ponds. Yeah. 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 And uh, the other thing, we had a big fish die off a few years ago. There were some beef, but our pond was littered with them. Basically, a ton of fish littered. And um, with some low oxygen. So I always thought, that algae produce oxygen. What's the deal? Why would, why would having too much algae remove oxygen? Why don't you explain that? So the same, the algae will produce in the daytime oxygen because it's photosynthesis. At nighttime, they're going to consume all that oxygen. They, so normally a pond should fluctuate with oxygen very mildly. You know, up in the daytime, down at nighttime, come back. But when you have extremely too much algae, go up. I mean, it's extreme high concentration of oxygen and down zero at night time. Up again, down. The fish still can't take that. And a couple of days like that, and it's like, I decide to die. I'm going to die. You know? <laughs> 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 it's stupid for me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I live on Lake One, which is the very first lake. It's the lake along the, the, the wall. And on February of 22, we had a really bad problem with algae in that lake, okay? okay. Um, nobody got in contact with us. We had to get in touch with them. You could just see it floating all over. The was, fish? Yeah, the algae. Algae, algae all over. I mean, I have the reports here. And unfortunately, uh, when I spoke to the people in Sandoval, the association, they told me my lake was lake number 22. Well. My lake was, no, I later found out it was lake one, so they didn't even take 
into consideration, and they checked that lake. They checked all these other ones, and they found all the algae in the pool. My wife wound up for a whole year going back and forth to respiratory doctors and everything. And other tenants down on the ground floor, second floor, you could smell what was going on here. The big thing is here is that solitude takes care of the lake, but we need to get someone in that sees what's going on at these lakes, because not everybody's going to call up and say, hey, I'm noticing all the stuff at my, at, at my lake. I know it depends on the wind. Sometimes it's all the way down one end, but sometimes it's all the way down the other end. So um, all of this stuff with all the chemicals and everything is all bad, but we need to have somebody that's monitoring these lakes and giving us a maybe either a monthly or, or bi-weekly or whatever report on the condition of the lakes. Well, I hate to say this, but that's them. You're paying for that. You're well, paying, you paying good yeah. money exactly. for getting good information. And why don't I have good information? Okay, what algae? Well, they the, should know what algae. Well, yeah, I'm telling you, right? It tells you everything. Yeah, but algae, algae, you know, like, they're full of different kinds. This is green algae. This is green algae. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and most recently, probably six months ago, we had another algae bloom in that pond. Um, I had to get in touch with solitude. I talked and made a call to the association here at that time. It was Vesta, and uh, they told me that well, we really can't give you any information. I said, well, why don't you get in touch with solitude? They finally did, because I kept bugging them about it. Now, not to throw, because then I'm throwing more work on you, but you have a pond watch. At least every month we do that. Right. So if you're interested in your pond, Grab a sample, bring it to us, or get it together with the well, team. Well, now I call up. In other words, if I see something, or somebody's complaining about it, or we smell something, or see something, because usually you can see it. Do I it right there. Right away. You can't wait a month. No. Do it right there. Bring it. They the sample it. lake one every month. It's on our list. Lake one. Yeah, and that's, a, and that's a big load for me. Because I cannot do, I mean, I have 150 samples to process, and you guys are taking a big chunk of that. Because, I mean, I can only take so many per for community. Some people come like with five, six ponds and like, oh my god. And then, what about the rest of the people who are in the park? So I, I gotta be careful about that. Take the worst ponds and then that's where it's gonna say monitor the worst ones. Yes. Do, do we just wanna Stu, do you just wanna go over what we do with Pond Watch as far as how many lakes we do every month versus well, not because we, we don't do all of the lakes. No, we only do only, five of them. And right. then the uh, Potable water, non potable water. Right. But Lake One is is one that we test every month. Right. And then how many times a year do we test all 26? Uh, twice, twice. Twice. Twice a year. Yeah. Which is a big load for me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you come with 27, I have to almost separate the, the, yeah. the whole lab just to do those yeah. guys. Um, yes, one. I saw that. I saw that in green. Yeah. yeah, look at that. I mean, it's actually having a large algae problem there, right there. And I'm like, why not sampling this one? No, 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 no. You gotta put your input in there. Um, so I kind of came up with a, a choice here. Like those ponds, is because they're overlooked. But if I had to choose a pond there, I'll take the ones who have the worst algae, like number one. I'll take that one right there. The, the ones who have like the algae is a sign that you have a problem with nutrients. And then the thing is, once you get that, find out where the nutrients are coming from. Then you have to start investigating. Okay, so who's fertilizing here on their own? Who's dog pooping so much? Who, they, that's part of the, each one of these communities have, you know, people around. And you can probably start looking at their yard and their grasses, like, it's very green, isn't it? I don't know, I don't mean to make a war in between you guys, but, but again, <laughs> Again, yeah, start, yeah, and that's right. I said, like, okay, find out where's the source of the problem, you know? Because the algae is not the problem. The problem is that what causes the algae to grow? So, uh, yes, oh, you got that in the camera. Oh, my God. Questions? <laughs> Let me switch to the movie. That's it. Is solitude here? Solitude is here? Is it? No. That's not good. I want to say this in front of them, too. Yeah.
Calypso Park is like two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like two small. Like one by the middle of the summer. Yeah. Like one is the summer building. Right. 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 The one surrounded by all the flight districts. Right. Right. Well, just pick us or him. All her. So, I know, it's yeah. kind of disgusting, but you know, that's when you got the public bags for. Uh, so, I, I'm the chairperson on the Lakes Committee, and I just wanted to say that the Lakes Committee were kind of new. There was a Lakes Committee and then there wasn't, and we're kind of new and we're all learning. But we're trying to work more closely with Solitudes and other vendors to build a relationship, to find out what they're doing, to ask questions. So, and we recently got control of the email. So, uh, we will be monitoring that. It was not monitored for a little while. Um, so, we're trying to work more closely with Solitudes. We're trying to communicate with them issues and find out what they're doing. You know, not every vendor is the best one, but there's also not a lot of choices out there. So we are trying to improve the relationship and improve the service that we're getting. So, just wanted to let I have you a question. Know that. Just we're wait. like 25, the one that has all the high numbers. <laughs> and, um, yeah, yeah. And in the last couple of days, I live on the side closest to the main road in my neighbors next door to me, and I've noticed that there's a slick of green and blue, like a slick that's traveling down. Is that the algae traveling? That's the algae. You, it looks, it looks like, um, it's like oil paint. Yeah, it looks, it looks like, paint. Like, like oil, uh, gasoline without the Exactly. Yeah. And, and it just goes in, and it's suspended in the column, in the water column. It's like, what is going on here? That is Microsystems' original sign. And um, if you smell it like dirt in there, that's it. And I haven't noticed it. You know, another, another way to identify, take that jar of that, shake it, and leave it standing for a while, and then it will pop up. Remember those? The, the test tubes, they were all topping out. That's like a good sign. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, so I've seen that same film on the water at times. And, and sometimes it is, it is it could be the, cop, the copper that they use to treat the filamentous algae. That because, and again, if, you, if we know what's happening in terms of service, that's a good point. We know they're working on it because sometimes it, it can come out as like, oh, that smells horrible, but it's because they just sprayed and, it, and it's sitting there and it, it will have that appearance. And so I can see where we can kind of get a false indication of a problem that's in the works of being addressed. The one warning I want to give you, maybe you mentioned the word copper sulfate is the chemical used by most. And again, I will say this in front of them because. It is a cheap way to control algae. What? Copper sulfate. Copper sulfate is the blue crystals, and they dissolve in the water, looks blue when they spray it. And that's the cheapest of all the, and it's legal to use it, don't get me wrong, it's illegal to use it. The problem with that is that it doesn't uh, stay long in the suspended in the, in the water to work the best. In Bali Mili, you'll see a whitish after that, that means it's precipitating, and the copper will go into the mud, into the shore, and they stay there as a metal. And there's all that issue that I fight them because these people are telling me, well, we're not killing the littoral plants. No, directly with the copper sulfate, indirectly. And here's the caveat. They spray down on the shoreline where you have the filamentous algae. It goes into the soil. And then the plants, who the roots are living in that soil, their bacteria that is associated with the roots, and the plants need the bacteria in the roots. They get killed by the copper sulfate, and then the plant dies, and the soil becomes a sterile because of the copper sulfate there. I've seen that so many times, and they don't ah, Now, what to do? You have to probably pay for a better product than copper sulfate, and insist that to use that one, and get rid of that copper, no copper sulfate in our, in our contract, because that's a big, bad one. And we've been fighting that, but hey, they're, they're private company. They can do whatever to make money. There's a um, hydroclean, which is hydrogen peroxide base. It's a chemical, no copper in there. There's cutrine, which is a chelated copper, which is better than copper sulfate. And yeah, there are other methods, you know, to eliminate algae, the alum and ultrasorb. And don't go with the dye. Have you ever seen the dye? They put a blue dye like to, to shade the ponds so they don't have algae on its ants. It looks so artificially ugly. Like blue, like a blue lagoon. It's not even blue. It's ugly. Yes, sir. What's the life expectancy of these plants? 
Say that louder. What's the life expectancy of these plants? Twenty something years, twenty five years. They say the water management. I read somewhere in there that after that you have to dredge it now. Not necessarily. They, the aerator will stop that dredging from happening because you're mixing, you're eliminating the muck, and you're controlling that. So the aeration is what is going to extend the life to yeah, years, 30 years, easy. Yeah. Yeah. How important is it to have plants in, on the ponds, the littorals and yes. the plants? So the littorals are plants yeah. that are on the shoreline. Mm -hmm. And normally nature will have them. But some people don't like it because that's where the gator lives. And blah, blah, blah. So, but then that's nature right there. And the plants itself are not pulling the nutrients from the water. What is pulling the nutrients, if you look at the plant cluster, there is filamentous algae, the scum. But you don't see the scum because you're looking at the flower plants and the plants. But the scum is there, and the scum is what removes the nutrients. By the way, the birds and the fish love the scum. You might not like it, but they love it. Birds come and they start eating the bugs that live in that scum. And the scum is filamentous algae. That's a good algae. That's not the poison, by the way. Filamentous algae. Although, if you get out of control and if it's covering the whole pond, absolutely treat it, you know, rake it or do something. Because it's too much. Too much is bad. But if you have a nice balanced littoral plants, I'm talking plants that are standing on the water and the leaves are outside, you know, and the flower. There's a long, whole list, which, by the way, I want to bring something else. But you have a question, but yes. So I was just going to ask, you talked about plants that are good. Can you speak a little bit about the ones that aren't, are not good, like the alligator weed and the invasive and the problems that it causes if it's not, if it's left untreated? Yes, in fact, there's a lot of bad um, littoral plants. Not bad, I should say. The plants are not bad or good. They're just plants. But they overtake like torpedo grass. And the companies know that and they spray it. And then there's torpedo grass and alligator weed. And I can present to you a website that we have created, the Hyacinth and other professionals in Lee County. It's called Wet Plan. And we have a lot of videos and a lot of webs, webinars explaining some of these things. Webplan.org. Yeah, that org. Yeah, org. For those of you who haven't been there. We have that on our web website only. Oh, you haven't? Yes, yeah. on our website. All right, well, let me, let me present this to you because this is the web plan right there. And these are a bunch of videos in that resource. The one I want to present to you is this one. It says, uh, no, beneficial rhetorals, that's good. There's another one that is about glycostomus. Oh, yeah, same lady here. Lesser heart. You mentioned that you have a problem with the customers. Yes. But customers is a, yeah, in fact, I wonder if this video runs. But again, I don't want to take it. And I don't even know if the sound will be good. Dealing with glucose. Ah. I guess we crashed the system. <laughs> anyway, you can find it there. And she talks about what? Yes. Oh, did I step on it? Oh, there we go. Anyway. That is a, a good source of, and what I, I was going to tell you about the glycostomus. So there are catfish coming from South America, and they bury, make holes on the bank. And as they make the hole, the whole bank is jeopardized but for erosion because you have the mowers passing by and then they collapse because the hole was really deep into the bank. So how to eliminate those? By hand. You have to go stick your hand in that hole, pull them out, and then please kill them um, humanely. You know, they're not humane. I shouldn't say this. Oh, well, what the hell? Already coming. It's a screwdriver between the eyes and the head. Yeah, you know, it's crack and then quickly scramble the brain. Because that guy is so hard. Imagine an armed catfish. I mean, you don't have a machete to cut their head. There's no machete that will go, but a screwdriver will go through that skull, and you can scramble their brain pretty quickly. That's the most humane thing. And I know. Don't let it dry and fluff. That's so horrible. Fly, fly. We have, you have it.
of here. Yes. Yeah. So they're they're horrible, and they rule records. Oh, that's the the gear. Oh my God. Yeah. So you shove that in the hole, or you stab them and pull them out. That one. Yeah. That. Now tilapia. Tilapia is another exotic. Um, yeah. Africa, and they they got the filter feeders. So, but then what they do is they filter the soil plankton, leaving the phytoplankton there. So they make the water more turbid, turbid, turbid. And then the first year they're gonna be fine. They're gonna reproduce, and their little young go into the mouth of the mother, and they they protect the young ones. So the next year, and then no bass is gonna be eating tilapia because they're protected by the mother. By the time the tilapia gets too big, the bass don't even mess with them. And, and that's the reason why every year, exponentially growth of the, the numbers of tilapia. In one time, you're going to have a, fit, uh, a freezing cold front, and it's going to kill them all, well, most of them. And just the strong one will survive, and the whole cycle will start again. Yeah, so it's, man, nature is amazing, because do they, why did the tilapia make that big hole, because you'll see the hole as a crater, and it's sitting in the middle, and that's how the nest is. The fish, the native fish, they don't have, they have some rocks in there, and you'll see some little gravel and stuff where they put the eggs and stuff, but tilapia is a crater, and you'll see them. So how to get rid of them? Do you have cat stuff? Yes. So you come with catfish pellets floating, and you toss it there, and you make noise, you know, sing, you know, make some noise, <laughs> because they hear you, and you and they associate the, soul, the noise with the catfish. Oh, yeah, food. And you try that several days, weeks. They last a week. You go there with a good person to throw the cast net, get them all. Drag it. And then you pull them out, sort them, because you might have some collateral damage, and you don't want the, the good ones. So just the tilapia, cichlids, all this exotic. And then they're not going to come back the next day. You have to start all over for another month. Yeah, as I train them again. Yeah. So if you fix the erosion, can they, they this can all start all over again? Talk about the erosion. Like thing. if you're like say I mean if they cause some erosion. What fish are we talking? The the the, the cause of the lack of either whatever fish that are, are rooting our lakes. Uh -huh. Okay, so say if you fix the erosion problem uh -huh. and you don't fix the fish problem, then... Oh, the, 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 yeah, the Plecoster is going to continue. It's going to continue, so we yeah. have... You've got to remove the tilapia, yeah. Well, we still have to get prices. Yeah, it's going to take a long time. So, yeah. some communities do something called the fish derby. <laughs> they pay prices, and they get prices. You know? The more tilapia you get, the bigger the price. Yeah. And then the these customers, ooh, super price because that is more expensive the damage from the customers on erosion than the tilapia and eating the yeah, making the water turbid. So that's gonna go. Oh yes, yeah. so so why nature does that? Is because when they remove the salt plankton, the pond more then is more turbid and the turbidity protects the tilapia from the birds who come and shoot that. Yeah. So that that's nature at its best, you know, making the water turbid. So the tilapia can be hiding underneath underneath that turbidity. Yeah. Is that a question? Yeah. Separate. But the um, the aerators, would that affect there's been some talk of recently um, that there some of our lakes used to have uh, what is it? White white, white, pelicans. white pelicans. And oh. they used to come in apparently like 30, 40 at a time. And now they're nowhere to be seen for the at least two and a half years. And I don't know, someone suggested that maybe the aerators, when they installed them, that that may have had something to do with it. Know. What's your thought? It's a very difficult question. I'm not a bird person, but if somebody's from an Audubon bird watcher, they will probably know that better than I do. Do you know something? Yes. So, so I would think that any time that there's wildlife, it's all, it's all about the food. So, so yeah, yeah. it would be based on food availability, which, which could be connected to other things that, that are going on in the ecosystem. And when we put the aeration in, um, that improved the oxygen levels throughout the water column. So we created more space for life to exist. And, it, and it, like, like Ernesto said, I mean, nature is amazing. It goes through changes. You know? So we, we, throughout time, we've seen these shifts. In biodiversity, when the snails came here, the apple snails, um, it started eating our plants. It was within a matter of a few years that the 
the limpkins, the birds came in, and, and they, they're very good. And, and I was so happy the day I saw a whole family of them that were marching around behind my house. And I know they're that bird that makes that scream, but, yes. but, but <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good you know, thing. That, it's a bad thing came, and then a good thing came, and then helped. So yeah, I think it's just such a dynamic. You are also know you're on the right track because food breeds other animals. And the, the, the story with the apple snail, that was a great one because the birds kind of, uh, the ones who learn how to eat them, they survive. And they have that already know how to. The ones who didn't know how to eat open and have, yeah, they die. It's like, okay, smart ones will go on. Not to be mean to the birds. On the pelicans, yes. the, the year after we installed the aerators, we did have pelicans. And then the last two years, I haven't seen any. But we did have them the first year after we had the aerators installed. Yeah. So yeah. it didn't keep them away that year. I see them. I mean, I'm not going to be shape pass a lot until I, I do see yeah. the spiraling circles of white pelicans. Yeah. So we know they're migrating here. But I think just as people got displaced by the hurricane, so did wildlife. And yeah. I, I've even Absolutely. seen additional things here that we haven't seen before almost immediately. You know, pairs of owls, you know, great horned owls. So. Hawks, you know, showing up as pairs because you know they lost their one. Right, yeah. So a lot of things have been pushed right. in, and you know, every, you assume everything west of here is a much more oh, shaped. I've seen pictures on uh, the Leaf County appraiser, which, by the way, that's the every year they take a nice high resolution picture of the whole county, and so you can go and see the condition of your ponds there every year after year. And the littorals in your ponds are very nice, very good. In fact, I almost wanted to come and do more littoral contrasting places that have littoral versus the non-littoral. The problem was that we, they didn't the reclaim water. A troll might study it way off because that's not natural. And then they have some other issues there. Yes? Um, I did want to say one thing on the littorals. No home elder should be cutting littorals ever and make sure that if you have your own landscapers, they don't cut any. We we haven't been in contact with the uh, landscapers for the community. No one should be cutting littorals. So. Unless they shouldn't mow within four feet of the water line. Every two or three months, they go right down to the water line anyway, no matter how you talk to them. Really? They're supposed to mow. So you watch them flash and the grass from the lake, you see them. They do it three times a year. Uh, five years ago, we had that problem when I was on the board on the uh, landscaper. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to stay away from the But no, they go ahead and do it anyway. They don't see they don't try to help or something. In fact, I wonder about some of those ponds that didn't have any nutrients in there. If the littorals are very rich there, they're actually the ones who are absorbing that. So you have a, a well balanced pond that's absorbing the extra nutrients because the littorals are there. And I don't know, I'm, I'm willing to, con to correlate that. Littoral princes versus lack of nutrients, and then just to see that that's another thesis. We, we did so, Ernesto. We did something like that where we took the uh, so so year for a five year period. We would look at the lakes and track every treatment that was done for algae, for weeds, um, and we would count just do counts on the number of treatments, and so. We got lower counts on the number of treatments in the lakes that had the most fullest littoral plants. So we, we could see that correlation in the data, even though it's kind of a weak theory, but but it did we did see the signs that when they got that healthy fringe, they're they keeping control of everything else. So it, it, and I told this to John too, it, it's where we get so at least I feel we get the most bang for our buck is from those plants. You know, that we get those in and we, we we're obligated to maintain those, to to annually inspect them and to replenish them for our environmental resource permit. So I, I think that's an opportunity we have. Right. In addition to that, that's where it saves a huge amount of money on the erosion. Yeah. Because those littorals will protect your bank. And if you don't have it, then you have issues of erosion in the year later. Is there is there any inspections of the littorals in Singapore right now? Uh, we have one done. Yes, um, thank you. <laughs> we had one done uh, last July. We had asked Solitude when Christina Kennedy was still here, the biologist, if she, during her normal inspection of our lakes, would also do a grade of those lakes. So she graded it based on uh, diversity, 
in density and health. So we've got at least a, a benchmark from a year ago, and John, it's probably something to consider now. Um, our plants were damaged by the hurricane, just like all, a lot of other plants. So this is the time of year they spring to life, but it's because of all that fertilizer when it first flush comes through, and it runs all those nutrients out, and those plants will kick in. But it would be, I think the timing of that assessment would be soon to see how do we look compared to last year using the same grading scales. Well, the, the reason why I ask is because the lake that we live on, there's not one more coral around that whole entire lake. That's we don't have one. Oh, really? So it's it's been, been like that for a long time now, yeah. but there is, there's no one number. 22. Uh, it's like 22. Long, long time. Let me find it. So we need it's 22. 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 It's a square. It's a square. It's a square. 22. It's way up there. Yeah. Isn't it tall? That's square. 22. Yep. 22. It's like that. It's been like that for a long time. There's no. There's no plants along the edge, and it's almost literally caving in. Yeah, and all and all that. Yeah. And this, I recall that lake when we used to make those wall grounds. It had a monoculture of spike brush. Uh, this was years ago, Jim. I think you remember. I mean, it was quite a heavy fringe all around. But the problem with the monoculture is it, it, it just doesn't have the diversity of plants to to, to adapt to all the changes. You know, so that's why you want. Very plants, but I was surprised when I saw that. So I don't, I don't know what would have happened to that spike brush just to where it all just disappeared. But you saw it on. Yeah. It disappeared after the ice cream, I'll tell you that. <laughs> that's, that's great. One thing we're asking our, our lakes community to do is put a plan together for, for erosion control a, a lot for the fiscal, for next fiscal year. But it sounds like maybe even sooner we need to. Uh, have a bid on on the autorals. What do you think? Yes. Yes. We, we could do some of that this year, even when we have to go to extra round. What do you think, Chuck? Yeah. yeah. So listen, let, let's do that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we have asked both solitudes and the lake doctor to look at the erosion issue and give us a quote, and to look at where there are autorals that we need more autorals. And give us a quote for that. We are not getting any response back from either. I know. Vendor. I mean, think though, if we look at priorities, maybe we should put the littorals first. Yes, I, I agree well, with you. Well, yes, but we've asked for both, so we yes. know what we're looking at, and we don't want to do a plan for one year. We of course want, not. We want to do a, an ongoing plan for the next five years and going forward. What's the regular things we need to be doing? Oh, no. <laughs> yes. what, what about the irrigation that we see going into the lakes? The, the sprinklers. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Well, so the irrigation. Off the water and, and okay. So okay. Then, but, okay. Go ahead. So we we contacted everyone from the neighborhood lot, neighborhood uh, the neighborhood reps and had them because some lakes have seemed to have a more serious problem than others. And we asked them to notify everyone in that area that to make number one to check or have your landscaper check that your Sprinkler heads are not going in directly into the water or directly into the street and through the storm sewer. We also um, have, you know, kind of, we've gone through the landscape committee to make sure they've talked to both landscape companies about that as well. And we ask that people not overwater. I mean, people go out and put their own program in. Some people are still watering every night. I see it. And it's like, stop. We, that's what's ruining the lakes. I mean, that's a, a big problem for our lakes. Um, I, I don't know how to make people do that. We've tried, con, you know, trying to get information out there. 
And if you notice that your sprinkler heads are going into the water, then you have to contact the right person to make those yes. adjustments right. so that yes. they're not going yes. into the water. And we, we explain that that's a, if you're, you, if you're no. in phase three, put a work order in, and they should adjust that. Do you all remember <laughs> Steve Buckman? Steve Buckman was um, very, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he started his uh, connection with us, Pond Watch and, yeah. and Sandoval. And he was thinking to propose um, a study or something where a whole lake will not be using at all irrigation or, yeah, and then leave the grass the way it is and to see how much different it looks versus the one that are constantly using irrigation, just to, to do a comparison. But I don't think he convinced everybody in his lake to do that. It's so hard that he almost give up, give up on that. So I, I understand that. Um, yes? I have a question. The, the bug spray that gets sprayed over our community to get rid of the mosquitoes, does that hurt the lakes? The mosquito the spray? Yeah, the yeah. spray of mosquito. Well, I want to say no, but yes, uh, they do it at night time. And they try not to... Okay, so the, the, the chemicals that they use for mosquito control, it's actually targeting the, the, the animals, the uh, mosquitoes. And they use less concentration that you can probably imagine with, by using this foggy, um, not the, the planes, I'm talking just the, uh, as far as going into the water, the organo molecules there it won't last that long. They do to break down even with the sunlight, so they don't have a long lasting. I tell you, things have changed a lot since we started in the 60s with mosquito control. Now we're using less chemicals that you can imagine. We don't use so many. Now we're using other alternatives, like BTI, which is a bacteria. And we're using many types of bacteria. Mosquito fish. We have now putting mosquito fish in many ponds just to do the biological control of that. Same with the bacteria. So the amount of chemicals that most people think, oh, mosquito control. Oh, and the desterilized mosquitoes. We also come into yeah. that. Fine. Little by little, we're expanding that program all over the county. They fought that the kids. Yeah. Successfully, they fought. Yeah. And in Sanibel and Captiva, it's successful there. But not for all mosquitoes, though. I mean, <laughs> we're not trying to get rid of all, just the ones who carry diseases. You might still have another one with a native, no disease carrier. Oh, you know, just, it's just the ones who carry diseases, the ones who care. We care. Wow. Six o'clock has been wonderful. Wow. One hour. If you still have any questions, we can just break off in small groups. And <laughs> <keep in. laughs> now, I'll stay here, I and mean, if you have more questions, because it, sometimes it's intimidating, you know. But then I'll be here to answer some questions. But I really thank you all for being here. You. you guys are really taking care of your, your community by being and listening to it. Pass the word. Oh, thank you.